dun, 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 dun. <laughs> Last night I was able to watch uh, The Best There Is, The Best There Was, and The Best There Ever Will Be. Um, the Brett the Hitman Heart documentary, this DVD honestly came out probably around 2005. Uh, and this laid um, the foundation for Bret Hart to return back um, to WWE. Um, finally, uh, you know, sort of make up with Vince McMahon, um, you know, make up with Shawn Michaels and come back into the WWE family. Um, at this time, Bret honestly still wasn't over um, the whole, uh, you know, Bret screwed Bret, uh, Montreal screw job um, stuff, but. Um, basically, the year before, um, the WWE had released a DVD um, about the Ultimate Warrior um, that was not uh, in the very best interest of the of the Ultimate Warrior. It honestly was sort of a smear campaign um, with a lot of uh, former wrestlers and managers, Hulk Hogan, Bobby Heenan. Um, we had. Uh, uh, the Brooklyn Brawler, um, lots of guys like that, honestly coming out and saying very negative things about what it was like to work with the Ultimate Warrior, um, and sort of playing down what he had meant um, to the WWF at the time. And um, I think Brett caught wind um, that WWE wanted to do a DVD on him and didn't want to see the same thing happen. Um, you know, Brett the Hitman Hart with the whole Montreal screw job. Um, even today, when it is brought up, um, you know, like on the uh, Monday Night War series that was on the uh, WWE Network a few years ago, WWF still portrays that they were in the right. Bret the Hitman Hart still portrays that, you know, it, it, you know that they purposely went out of their way to hurt them. Um, both of them state their case. Um, they're pretty evenly stated, but. When you watch something on the network, they're normally always going to say that Vince was right and he did what he had to do. Um, and he didn't live up to the deal that Brett wanted was to not drop the, the, the belt in Canada, even though that Vince was scared that Brett would leave uh, and he would go to Nitro, um, where he had just signed a contract and he would um, bring the belt with him and, and do that, I guess, to the Medusa and throw it in the trash. Um, the one cool thing um, to show that, you know, Brett, you know, did say that he would come work uh, together with WWE was that Vince McMahon personally opens up uh, the DVD, the, the documentary, and he's just saying that he really appreciates Bret Hart um, coming and working together um, with the WWF. Brett got to personally pick um, the matches. He got to tell his story. Um, whether if it was the good, the bad, or the ugly, um, ab about everything that happened in his career. And um, basically, it is a WWF production, but it's pretty much hands-off, besides for the editing and things like that. Brett got to tell the story that he wanted to tell. He got to pick the matches that he wanted to go in there. And this, honestly, is probably one of at least the top 10, maybe even debatable top five documentaries um, as far as DVD sets, um, the Chronicle, someone's career, I think that honestly it would have to be one of the top uh, DVDs that they ever made. Um, too many times, you know, uh, you know, documentaries like the Shawn Michaels documentary, um, Heartbreak and Triumph. It came out before his career was over. Um, the Rock, um, that one came out before WrestleMania 28. Although they do hype it, they don't talk about WrestleMania 28. They don't. Re they don't talk about WrestleMania 29. They're not going to go back in and fix those. And so they, they pick some matches and put it on there. And then once the career is finally over, then they come out with another set of matches. And um, although they're all good, they're not all in the same set, which means they're not all in the same order. Um, Brett the Hitman Hart does have um, other sets that have, have, have come out. Um, there's the uh, Bret Hart, the Dungeon Collection. Um, those were um, some... Uh, Matches that he got to pick uh, personally that uh, maybe sort of talk about and show matches that haven't been seen uh, by most fans and they're not looked at as the best matches that he's ever had. Um, he's also had the Heart, uh, maybe it was called the Heart Dynasty or the Heart, Heart, I don't think it was called the Heart Foundation, but it just talked about the whole Heart family. Um, 
That's a good one. I wouldn't say that it's great. It's got a really good match with him and Owen against the Steiner brothers on it that I pull out every once in a while and watch. Um, but when you talk about this documentary, it, it is really, really good. It, it outlines everything that happened in Brett's uh, you know, life, growing up in the Hart family um, with his dad, Stu. Um, it talked about him you know, having his brothers uh, in the family and, and trying to find his place on um, what he was going to do. Um, and even talks about how he got into the business and how he got to go on his first actual, uh, I guess you can call it a wrestling trip, uh, to Puerto Rico because his, his brother Bruce got hurt and they'd already sent the ticket and in those days it didn't have a full name on it. So it just said, be heart. Um, so Brett took the ticket. He went to go wrestle in Puerto Rico and just kept bringing on his skills, um, Brett really um, polished himself up wrestling and stampede wrestling for his dad. Um, and they, they talk about feuds that he had against um, uh, uh, Dynamite Kid. Um, and they talk about how good these matches were. And Jericho talks about watching these matches as a kid uh, and, and just how much they stood up. Um, when a lot of the promotions around the company, territories, um, we're closing down because of Vince McMahon buying them out. Um, that is when Stampede Wrestling closed for the first time. It would reopen a couple of times along the way. Um, but that is when basically Stu said that he would close. Um, but a lot of the guys from the company would get jobs within WWF. Um, Bret Hart was one of those guys to come in. Um, but it was very easy to, to tell that Bret didn't have a plan on what they were going to do with him. He easily was losing a lot of matches. He said he was very careful that he did not want to become a, a job guy, where that was all that he was going to be, you know, sort of classified into. And then all of a sudden one day, um, somebody within WWF came to him and said um, that they had a plan. Um, and and, and they, they, they laid it all out for him, where Bret Hart was going to become a cowboy. Um, he was going to ride out uh, to the ring on a horse. Um, and this was a, a pretty good idea at the time because WF was making the, the, the action figures and um, a cowboy Bret Hart action figure probably would stand out on the shelf and maybe it would sell like that. But at the last minute, Bret um, got cold feet uh, and, and a lot like uh, Jerry Seinfeld, not wanting to be a pirate. Um, Bret had to go tell the office that he didn't want to be a cowboy. Um, and they couldn't believe that he was passing up on this, but he did have a rebuttal uh, where he basically said at the time, Jim the Anvil Nightheart was being managed uh, by Jimmy Hart, but they were really going nowhere. He said, why don't you pair us all together as a tag team, have Jimmy manage us and call us the Hart Foundation. Um, that actually started rolling out um, and uh, um, they took off like wildfire. They, they gelled really well. They were a really good team. Um, and Vince even told Brett that they just sort of did this to keep him happy. Um, they, they thought they would just sort of buy him some time until the next idea came along. Um, but uh, Anvil uh, and Brett went on a good run until at least 1990. And they did have the tag titles. They, they, they weren't like demolition. They didn't sit on them for the longest time. So there was a lot of good teams um, at, at that time. Um, but they definitely were in the conversation for being one of the top teams in that division. With Demolition, uh, Strike Force, um, the Rockers, Oriented Express, um, the Rougeau Brothers, the Killer Bees, etc. There was a lot of freaking good tag teams uh, in there. And, and to stand out and, and, and get noticed um, took a lot of work. Uh, tag Team Wrestling, WF cared about it back in the day. Unlike now, we're guys get paired together and you're either in the tag uh, title picture or you're barely even on television it is pretty much the way it is. Um, once uh, they decided um, that Brett uh, you know, was, was going to go on his own and they were going to slip them up, um, that was around 1991 um, where Brett got built up and had a big match at Madison Square Garden at SummerSlam 1991 against Mr. Perfect where he ended up winning the Intercontinental title. Um, he would hold that for a year um, until basically Brett went to Vince and uh, they were going to hold SummerSlam uh, 1992 over in Wembley, England. And um, especially with Davy Boy Smith being the hometown guy, 
Brett said, if you let us go out there and, and wrestle a match against each other, we'll give you the best wrestling match that you've ever seen. And uh, Vince believed in Brett and um, had them actually main event the show at, uh, for the Intercontinental Championship. And, you know, there was some stiff competition on that show. At that time, you had Macho Man Randy Savage wrestling against the Ultimate Warrior um, for the WWF Championship. You also had Kamala um, going up against The Undertaker. And um, they, they ended up being the main event. Um, Davey Boy got the best of Bret that night. And um, from there is when they decided they were going to make Bret Hart move up the card and actually wrestle for the championship where he beat Ric Flair. Uh, I believe the show was in Saskatoon. And for one reason or another, um, I think this was shown on primetime wrestling um, on television. I think it was it was re released on a uh, Coliseum home video. And that was it. It wasn't built up like a big pay-per-view. Um, WWF was moving into a new direction um, where they were going with younger guys. They were calling it the new generation. Um, guys like Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair were being phased out. Um, and this is what it was going to do. Um, they talked about, you know, Brett, um, you know, being the guy. Um, and, 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 you know, uh, at this time he would go out and he would win the King of the Ring. Um, but, uh, you know, they, they build up to Shawn Michaels, his rival from being in the Rockers, um, pushing to become that number one guy in the company as well. Brett is really negative on Shawn, uh, basically saying that Shawn should let him have his time as champion. Uh, at this time, um, I'm, I'm free, I'm sort of guessing here, but Brett probably was champion on and off. You know, from WrestleMania 9 until WrestleMania 12, that's that's the four years, basically, as champion. How long did Brett really want to hold that belt for um, before they did the, uh, the Iron Man um, in Anaheim? Um, but uh, they had um, Sean win the title there, um, and, and Brett's even negative about the training videos that they did, just basically portraying Brett as being an older guy who, you know, they, 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 the way they had him run when he was jogging made him look old and, and beat up. And Sean was just being briskly running up stadium steps and stuff like that. And he thought they were putting him out to pasture and that, that, that you know, just wasn't fair to what they were doing. Um, you know, Sean and, and, um, and Brett would go on to have a huge rivalry um, that would that would get capped off when uh, they had the Montreal screw job, which I believe was almost two years after WrestleMania um, that they did the Iron Man match. So that, that was the first time I think they were able to get them together um, to have uh, the rematch uh, from WrestleMania, which makes that match even bigger. Um, but uh, you know, Brett and Vince had signed a 20-year deal um, that at the time WF realized they weren't going to be able to live up to. Um, so Brett went out and signed another deal to go to WCW. So they had to get that title off of him. Um, everybody knows the story. Brett feels like he was lied to. Um, and they split up and they went their separate dir directions after, um, you know, it didn't go Brett's way. Um, Sean ended up winning the championship and that's where, you know, WWF and Vince would go into defense mode. Um, while Brett went to WCW and um, Eric Bischoff says that he signed Brett because at the time TBS, TNT were um, you know, pressuring him to get his own show uh, where Brett was going to be the main guy um, for Thunder, the, the new show that was starting, which doesn't make sense to me because Brett had his debut on Nitro. He was on Nitro all the time. Uh, but then again, people said the same thing about, you know, John Cena and Daniel Bryan when they won the mid-card championships at WrestleMania 31, that, you know, Cena would be on Raw, Bryan would be on SmackDown defending those titles, and they would, they would make those belts matter. Um, but WCW was never able to get the ball rolling um, under Brett, and his career ended after, you know, getting kicked by Goldberg, where he suffered a concussion. After the concussion, he had a stroke, and... Um, you know, that was the end of his career, and he did a lot in this business that needs to be realized. People have watched my videos and commented on them in the past thinking that I was very negative on Brett. I think I am very negative on the Montreal screw job and, and, and what went down there, but as far as watching Bret Hart when I was a kid, Bret Hart was one of my favorite wrestlers. And uh, uh, rest, uh, the, the SummerSlam 1991 match against Mr. Perfect is probably one of my favorite matches um, that I used to watch as a kid. So 
Bret Hart was the best. I don't see how you don't own this DVD in your collection, but if not, make sure you check it out. It's only a few bucks used on Amazon. Peace out, everybody.